Hi, I'm Tracy McDaniel. At Choose New Jersey, we work to attract jobs and businesses to our state by promoting New Jersey's world-class advantages for companies big and small. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. Healing begins here. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. MagnaCare. Sun National Bank. The New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child. And by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger, powering NJ.com. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, Italian you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. These are the stories of people whose lives have been transformed by climate change. We used to have seasons back then. Right. Now we don't. Could Yemen run out of water? Yes, possibly. This was the first city to run out of water. Water just took everything away. Climate disruption is not a political issue. It's a moral issue. I don't know what causes it. It doesn't matter. It's happening. This is the biggest story of our time. And this is the time to tell it. Folks, this is one-on-one, uh, -on -one, in this case one-on-two, -on -two, from the Tisch WNET studios. I'm introduced two of our very special guests. They're responsible for putting this together. Uh, David Gelber, executive producer of Years of Living Dangerously, which is an eight-time, excuse me, an eight-part series on Showtime. Nine part. <laughs> Thank you part. for correcting us. <laughs> and uh, Chris Hayes, who we know from MSNBC every night, but also is he a correspondent with Years of Living Dangerously. It premieres April 13th on Showtime. A nine part nine series. Part um, set this up for us. Um, you can say it's about climate change, but it's about so much more. Talk to well, us. I mean, we just decided I was at 60 Minutes for a very long time and my closest friend at 60 Minutes and I thought, that this is such a huge story that we wanted to devote our professional careers to, to covering climate change. <clears throat> and um, we were struck by the fact that the, that the big media was essentially underplaying it. I mean, you had a presidential election in 2012 when there was no question, not one question about, about climate change. Mm. And it really is, I mean, 20, 30, 40 years from now, people are going to look back on that election and say, how could that possibly have happened? But our idea was essentially to use this, the, the the storytelling uh, narrative techniques at, uh, that we had picked up at 60 Minutes and apply them to the issue of climate change. I mean, tell stories that have uncertain outcomes. I mean, it's an amazingly dramatic story. And in mm. general, I would have to say that the environmental movement has not done a great job of, of connecting human stories. I was just to say, it's much more personal and human. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge is, and I, I wrestle with this every day in my own show, trying to, you know, cover climate, is that, uh, carbon is invisible. Uh, temperatures, the difference between a global average temperature of, uh, you know, 72 and 74 degrees uh, doesn't register day to day, right? So you've got this abstraction. You're trying to cover this abstraction. And when you're, when you're on television, you need pictures. What do I show? What do I show? I show a map getting warmer. I show uh, the sun setting. I mean, literally, like, we're pr right. producing a segment on climate change, like, B-roll of the sun setting? Like, what? Visual. So what the genius of years is to go find the points at which uh, climate disruption is already happening, the people, the human beings it's affecting, and show what that looks like. And you, you can see from that clip, I mean, the, you see Yemen and you see, um, you know, you see the Arctic, you see Hurricane Sandy, you see for your own eyes, with your own eyes, that this is a thing happening now. We are on the front edge of this era. It is happening to real people right in this moment. And it is an incredible job of visual storytelling on a story that is usually poorly told visually. But you had so many, for those who are convinced that, you know, it doesn't exist, right. 
take a look at the nine-part Showtime series and then, then decide. <laughs> or don't get the information and keep believing what you want to believe. <laughs> that being said, of all the different options <clears throat> you had to tell this story, how did you select these places and these people? Well, I mean, in the first episode that will air on April 13th, um, Tom Friedman from The Times does a story about climate change in the Arab Spring. And he goes to Syria where, and, and, and reveals the fact that really hasn't been reported, that, that the drought in Syria had a lot to do with the situation that has evolved in Syria. I mean, it took a stressed society and made it much worse. Um, uh, in the case, of, Chris and I did a story about Staten Island. I mean, we went out to, uh, to Tottenville on the south uh, shore of Staten Island. Mm. A day or two after the, uh, the storm hit, we found a woman who lost her husband and her daughter. Is that Pat Tresh? That's Pat Tresh, yeah. How'd you, did, did you find her? she find you? Someone well, tell you about it? What her. happened? I mean, you know, we, we were in the neighborhood. We just basically were in the neighborhood. And we also met the congressman from Staten Island, who's a Republican congressman. Well, Congressman Graham, we're actually going to show that in just a bit. But, but go back to, to Pat. Pat lost, <clears throat> in, in Sandy, she lost her... Husband and her daughter, and <sighs> in the most... It was the most wrenching and difficult interview I've ever done as a journalist. I mean, I talked to her it was a month after yeah. after it had happened, and uh, you know they'd been through Irene, <laughs> and they've been you know everyone said leave. They left for Irene. Someone broke into their shed and stole a bunch of tools. So Sandy comes and they think, well, we left for Irene for no reason. Someone broke in. We're going to yeah. stay. And they're having. I mean, it's it's a, out of a horror movie. I mean, they're having dinner. And the water just comes, and all of a sudden the floors are moving, and they go up to the bathroom, and they're in the bathroom. They're holding on to the shower rail with her daughter, and then a wave comes and just and takes them out, takes the house out, takes her out, takes her out to the water. A piece of debris comes, hits her, and her daughter goes under, and she's swept out, and she floats and ends up just awash in debris in the middle of the night, staring up the night sky hypothermic and rescued by local firefighters. And I mean, you just think about like this profound fact about life that it can change in a heartbeat. Like that morning started for Pat Dresch and her family like every other morning and it ends up with just total indescribable tragedy. Um, and you did that interview. And I went and talked to her and it was, I mean, this is someone who is, you know, clearly in the grips of the most profound kind of trauma you could imagine. Um, slightly disassociated, uh, adaptively disassociated, I would say. Um, but that's the point, right? And this is, the, those are the stakes. Like, that's, those are the stakes. There will be more of that. There will be many more stories like that. There are already stories. Connected to climate change. Yes. Because we and know, So people want to say that. Ha for those who yeah. say. Right. And I want to set up this, this Grimm thing, uh, Congressman Grimm thing in a second. But for those who are right now watching us on public broadcasting saying, what is that right. horrific, horrific right. unimaginable right. story? That Forget about a story. That's real life. Right. Situation have to do with climate change, you say? Well, what we know, what the scientists are telling us, is that one foot of that storm surge was due to human uh, uh, forcing of the, uh, of the climate, I mean, to, to, uh, the, to the fossil fuel emissions, which one are foot. responsible for, for an additional foot of... Right. Um, uh, well, the water's up, already up a foot higher than it should and, be and before know, the storm comes. And we right? know that seven, uh, roughly 70,000 people, five square miles in New York City, were affected by Sandy, who otherwise wouldn't have been affected had it not been That's for... That's what uh, that foot transfers to, yeah. right? That foot of water, which doesn't sound like a, mu a lot when you're talking about the bay. For people's lives. People's lives? That's and life and death. That's the difference between... Literally the difference between... And, and the other thing I think it's important to think about in the context of extreme weather and climate is that what you end up getting is people want to have a debate or a question about cause and effect. Did climate change cause Hurricane Sandy, which is the wrong question. Then it contributed to making it worse? It contributed to making it worse, but even more importantly, every model we have of climate in the future tells us extreme weather events will be more likely. So every extreme weather event we have yeah. now is a test of the society's resilience in the face of an era of repeated climate disaster. Let's do this. As we set up uh, this interview that um, Chris did with um, the shy and retiring congressman from out in uh, Staten Island, Michael Grimm, do us a favor. Set up the, the other card. You're, you're one of a group of very talented and 
pretty well-known and important correspondence. Who else do you have? I'm the least well-known correspondent <laughs> by far, actually. Yeah, I saw that list. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the best, though. Um, <clears throat> just an absolute joy to work with this guy. Um, so Harrison Ford is, is in the first episode. Who? Harrison Ford. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Harrison Ford uh, does a story. But Harrison Ford, he does a story about Indonesia and deforestation, which contributes okay. tremendously to, to, to the heating of the planet. And but Harrison is not just an I mean, this guy knows this subject. I mean, he's been involved with conservation international. Harrison for Ford. Many you don't have Arnold. Uh, we do have Arnold. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, who, who, who hangs out with some uh, hot shots with some uh, wildfire fighters and is terrific. And really, if all the American politicians who have engaged with this issue... He's been out front for a while. He's been yes. terrific. People issue. think what they want about Arnold. No, no, he's been he's consistently been, he's been concerned. The single most consistent... Leslie and Stahl? Strongest. Leslie Stahl is in it. Uh, Matt Damon uh, does a piece about heat waves. Uh, America Ferreira, uh, the uh, ugly yeah. daddy actress. Olivia, Tom Friedman. Olivia Munn, Tom Friedman. Um, Olivia Munn, who was... Uh, yeah, in, she's uh, one of my wonderful. favorite shows on... Don't even say it. HBO. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, she's great. Newsroom. She, yeah. Newsroom, yeah. yeah. She she does a um, a profile of Jay Inslee. The she's governor. not attractive enough. No, she's I'm not. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I stop joking. <laughs> it's public television. I'll stop screwing around. Um, um, who else do you have? Anybody else? Oh, yeah. But gosh, I'm going to forget something. Right, hold yeah. He'll come Michael back. Michael C. Hall. Mike, uh, okay. Don Cheadle. Don Cheadle. Don Cheadle, the best. Uh, another Showtime yeah. show I really love. Um, can we do this? Set up the Grimm thing. Go. So, uh, Republican congressman from Staten Island, Michael Grimm, he had to deal with the wreckage of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and then the next, after dealing with that, and, and, and he did an incredible job, I would say, of delivering services to his constituents. I agree. An amazing job. Then the question is, okay, you're, this Staten Island's not going anywhere. The water's not going anywhere. Where are you on climate? And we have a big uh, conversation about that. This is uh, Chris Hayes, together with uh, Congressman Grimm from the nine-part uh, documentary series on Showtime. Check it out. I don't think ever trained to see your friends and neighbors in total despair, hopelessness. And it just hit me harder. One of the things that was interesting, the governor said this was a wake-up call about climate, specifically, when after this happened. And I'm curious just what your reaction is to that. The climate overall has changed. But let's leave out the part of whether it's man-made or not, because I don't think the science is there to tell us what's causing it. Mm -hmm. I think Mother Earth evolves, and patterns change every so many hundred years or thousand years, and we're in part of a process of changing. But I don't want to get into the political debate of what's causing it. And so uh, you're an objective journalist, and you're covering your mouth because? <laughs> <laughs> because I am trying to not give away my reaction to that dodge. Which, which, which would be normally? Uh, you know, you can't say, you, you, you cannot. <clears throat> Did you want to say you're kidding me, Congressman? I didn't want to say you're kidding me. I just, I, what, I, what I was holding back is, that's crap. You, you cannot, you, what you cannot do is you cannot identify a policy solution if you don't talk about the cause. And what I think is fascinating about that clip and something you see yeah. more and more commonly is the reality of extreme weather is harder and harder to deny. And so the people who were invested in denying climate change have gone from denying that to denying the causal link because you cannot look around yeah. at, at the maps of the- it's All around us. Yeah, everywhere, the drought in California. And so now this is the second, this is the sort of second move dodge, which is, okay, fine, you guys. The weather's changing, but who knows why? But I have to say that that, uh, that Michael Grimm was incredibly gracious with us, and we actually yeah. followed him over the oh, course yeah. of a year. Uh, we saw what he did for his constituents in Staten Island, and we followed his, the evolution of his thinking on but, the But issue. respectfully, in the end, would not acknowledge that a policy change needs to be made. I so, didn't say um, that. Well, he, I'm he, saying that. I'm asking. He, he, I, I don't want to give it away because he actually, his trajectory. Well, he does. And, I apologize. His, if well, I'm he, wrong no, no. That. His trajectory is fascinating and deeply, deeply illuminating and illustrative. Then I take that back. And then that's why politics. it's more important yeah. that people see the entire nine part yeah. series. Real quick before I let you out of here, what can people on public broadcasting on the PBS system watching us right now, what can they do right now if they want to be a part of the solution? Uh, well, I mean, I think, the, I think the solution is putting a price on carbon. I think that's the single biggest solution. I think that, you know, uh, getting in, I mean, figuring out ways to join. I shouldn't say others. solution. They want to contribute in a meaningful right. way. Yeah. There's no solution, per se. Well, well, there are some solutions. I mean, one of the things that happened in, in, the, in the West Coast not too long ago was that a whole bunch of folks in Washington State got together and stopped several coal export depots from being, from being instructed. That's a big deal yep. because the coal industry is looking to essentially save itself. Hmm. 
uh, declining demand in the U.S. They're looking to save itself by sending coal to Asia. And there was a political movement there hmm. in the West Coast, in Oregon and Washington, uh, to stop it. And yep. it, it's, it appears to have been stopped. Does the series talk specifically about tangible things yeah. that yeah. Ha are yeah. happening across the country? We covered that story in the, in the yep. Pacific Northwest. Okay. Um, so it is Years of Living Dangerously, a nine-part series on Showtime. It begins, this program will be seen before and repeat after, but it begins on... April 13th, 10 p.m., Sunday night. Great. And Chris can be seen every night at 8 p.m. on MSNBC. Right. And uh, folks, I want to thank you, David and Chris, for joining us on Public Broadcasting. Thank to you. talk about this very important series. This is an incredibly important issue that affects all of our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back uh, from the Tish WNET studio right here in the heart of New York right after this. Thank you. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Kathy Lee's gone, so I'm Elvis Lee. Yes! What a night at the iHeartRadio Music Festival with my boys, The Wanted. Hello. Hey, E.T., it's Elvis Duran in New York City. I found an artist you should know. I don't want to be that typical radio guy that wears friggin' Hawaiian shirts and bowling shirts. <laughs> we look good together. You have interviews with these big superstars that nobody gets. Oh, yeah. my gosh! Thank, Thank you. you. She showed up in lingerie to Elvis Duran's Z100 morning show. Jennifer Lopez and Pitbull. This is called Live It Up, the world premiere. When she walked in for the first time and she looked at me, she said, you are, you are the man. I'm like, what? Lady Gaga says that to me? Wow. Man, he goes from Lady Gaga to us. Steve Adubato here. And, but go back in. It's Elvis Duran, uh, host of Z100's Elvis Duran and the morning show, uh, seen live in all kinds of markets all across the country. Around the world. Around the world. It's 6 to 10 every morning, right? Absolutely. Hey, Until much, they fire me. No, they're not firing you any time soon. How much fun was it seeing that clip? You know what? I, if I wasn't me, I'd be sort of impressed with me. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> that's that a, impressive. Is that an egotistical thing to say? That, no, you know, to me, and just like you do, it's just a part of your job. It's what you do. But when you go home and watch you do what you do, you're like, wow, I'm pretty darn good. Except no one else in my house is impressed. Why is that? You know what? Move to another house. <laughs> that's what I did. But you know what? We do what we do because it's what we do, and I don't know anything else yeah. to do. It so happens I do what I do with the Lady Gagas of the world and the Mariah Careys and lingerie of the world, and you do it with people who have brains and know about politics. Great people. You know, we could hey. be dipping ice cream at Baskin Robbins. We'd be uh, just I'm as great doing away, that. I'm man. Um, <laughs> hey, when did you know that you were going to get into radio. I was saying, when did you know you were going to be a star? Um, when did you know that radio was your thing? I was molested by radio at a really <laughs> early age. You know, I grew up kind of a loner. Uh, I Where? Had a few, uh, Dallas, Texas, the suburbs yeah. of Dallas. And I would be listening to these DJs screaming up these intros of songs. Hey, here's another song by the Beach Boys. I'm like, wow, OK. They seem like they're having fun. They're talking about music I love. They're giving away concert tickets and trips around the world. I just thought it was a great thing. But he was my friend. The DJ was my friend when I was alone. And just as you drive into work every day and you're alone in your car, I'm there with you and you and I are friends. And I really thought that connection was so important. And uh, it's, it's been working out ever since. But that's there. Now, getting to New York, complicated journey? Uh, I never meant to end up in New York, you know, in radio in those days. Is that which true? I, yeah. I, you, you, back then, you went to where the jobs were. And so it was Dallas to San Antonio to Houston to Atlanta to Philadelphia to New York. By the way, you hear the sirens right behind? Yeah. That's how you know we're here, right? My ride is here. <laughs> Whoa, I'm having a heart attack on PBS. Um, so when does New York happen? New York happened uh, for me in the late 80s. And so I've been at Z100 Radio for 25 years, which is... Sort of unheard of. I've been hosting the morning show for over 16 years, which is very unheard of. Describe that show. Uh, our show is a combination of friends getting together every day in very close quarters. So we're forced to deal with each other's phobias, problems, loves, dislikes, food allergies. And there's this energy that comes off of it. Then you introduce the phone and social media where people interact with us live, which is a fantastic way to do a yes, show, Totally show. Live. Who else is on the show? Oh, God, on the spot. Uh, I've got beautiful women, Bethany and Danielle. I've got, uh, I've got... Is it a regular cast? Is it a regular, as an irregular? As no, no, they got like regular people, is it, or is it all you? Is it you and other people? You know what? 
if I did the show by myself, it would be so boring. Like your show, for instance. Who's it's Jerry just, Jones? It's just you. How boring is this show because it's just you? Oh, okay, mind if, if it were me, forget it. It'd be like nobody watching. I'm but, kidding. But no, seriously, you've got these people. I'm kidding you. But stop, I know. Okay. But, but the thing is. I love you. I love you too. All right. But the thing is, it all revolves around you. But the thing, there is pressure for you four hours a day to keep that thing going. I'm there to push the buttons. You know what you're doing. You know how to push my buttons or anyone else you're interviewing. You know where to go to get them to well, squawk. Well, you think you know. I, 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 well, you, we play off our instincts and our experience, right? Right. But you know those people, but you've got to bring them the audience, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's being as inclusive as possible for a lot of people in a short amount of time. It, it, it takes work. I'm dead by the end of four hours. People say, Exhausted. oh. Yeah, people say, you just get in there and talk for four hours. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what? My brain, she can't handle much more. And the music, uh, describe, I, my understanding is that there's less music today than there was a while back. There are fewer less record, fewer. On our show. Yes, yes. Yeah, we, we play like three songs an hour, because let's be honest, we eat a lot of fiber, we gotta go. You know what I'm saying? Those muffins are full of fiber. <laughs> But, you know what, when we first started doing the morning show 16 years ago, we were playing 12 songs an hour. 12? And so we, how much talk is left? We would go, hello, and they would go, oh, they're singing, shut up. But we realized it wasn't interesting. People can get music anywhere now. You can get right. music anywhere. But we need to provide something they can't get elsewhere. So we need to talk. And the music sort of sets the pace for the day and the station. Right. It's a pop culture thing with the, the, the music of today. And it all works together. The technology, the iHeart radio app, how yes. does it change things? A lot. It's a game changer. Uh, now with iHeartRadio, not only can you hear our show around the world, but you can hear a lot of different radio shows around the world. You can create your own music station by creating your own artists. It's, it's a fantastic way to get your content every day, but that's where it's going. The transmitter that, that beams into your car every day, that's gone. That's going to be gone before that's you not know it. it. But it's going to be gone. It's going to be just broadband and, you know. And the social media thing is, is dramatically. Love it. Because? Well, you know, for instance, uh, I, sort of a, a cousin of social media, texting. Yeah. Uh, I can be sitting there interviewing you on my show, watching people texting live, and if five or six of them say, this guy is really, really sexy, put a picture of him up now. I'll say, hey, <laughs> gotta take a picture of you. And I serve my audience immediately. It's like having a producer in the room with you. Social media, the same, the same thing. When watching you, Twitter. When you were saying that guy's really sexy, you didn't mean that hypothetically. No, you are. You didn't mean that. I wanna make love to you right now. I love that. Speaking of. Yes. A while back. Do we have you, time? Well, we not, well, yeah. Okay. Um, a while back, you came uh, out publicly. Came out. You know what? Uh, what does that mean? You, did you, I never came out and said, I'm not saying that you would be attracted to me if... Oh, I am. <laughs> well, now I really feel good about myself. But, <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but you, 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 made, you didn't even make a big deal I about it. I never came out. I never said, attention, I have an announcement to make. I am a gay man. I never did that. Uh, I just never included it in the show. I was the host of the show. And I didn't want to really... St I didn't want that to be the headline because I knew it would be distracting at right. the time. In this day and age, it's kind of stupid not to because I do a show just like you about sure. reality and being honest. And so if I wanted to talk about my life at home, I had to talk about being a gay guy. And so I never really came out. I was just, just the closet door was always open and you know, I just kind of poked my head out every once in a while. Reaction? The reaction was boring. <laughs> I tell you, and it's a good thing. You know what? Uh, you Nothing? Know, the opposite would have been people picketing and saying, don't let my kids listen to this gay guy. Uh, the reality was, everyone's like, oh, he's gay. Okay, what else? I never wanted this to be the Elvis Duran is gay show. That's my headline. Right. Because it's not. You know, being a gay man, in my opinion, is, well, that's a part of me, but that's not me. That's a part of me. You know, that's fascinating. I, I've got other things to talk about, and I never want to make that an agenda that clouds a show for many people. <clears throat> well, that's part of your life, but the other part of your life is you do the red carpet. Yes. Yeah, for E? Uh, no, for uh, oh, Entertainment Tonight. Be, I'm sorry. It has an E in it. That's good. Shoots. It's okay. We beat them in the ratings. It's all good. Okay, uh, you're for E. T. T. Exactly. You're for E.T. Hey, you got, you're good on the red carpet. Why don't you do more television? You know, television has never been my goal. Uh, radio, doing radio and doing radio really well has been my goal. And uh, every once in a while, I'll do a TV thing here or there. And it's fun. You it's get great. asked a lot, though, I bet. I do. I do. 
But you know, look, you know, you know, I'm a guy. I'm a, you know, I'm not, the, I'm not a young guy anymore, and I've got a couple of chins, and so I'm not the typical. Hey, how you doing? You know, look at you. Who has to say? You're, you're a freaking GQ model. You can do TV. I'm sorry. What did you say? GQ model. I heard you the first time. I just want to hear it again. No, but show, show the shot of, of Elvis because I just get out of here. You look That's, fabulous. Is that me on the right? That's you and Lady Gaga. Yeah, there she is. You look fab. Give me the other shot because I see that one's a good one too. Get the heck That's out Rihanna. of here. But you do look great. I'll get to the charity work. I'm talking about how good he looks. You do Is someone talking to you? Do you hear voices too? Yeah, they're I telling me to get everything I want to ask. They're saying, stop asking that. All right. But you do look Why great. are they so uptight? But, but in all seriousness, do you get concerned about, because another uh, radio personality, Wendy Williams, who we've had on here several times, Love made the her. transition. Now she does TV. Do you ever say to yourself, my brand is primarily radio. I got to stay here, even though the TV, or do you say, hey, it's all just good? Well, I'm stupid to say to myself, it is all about radio, and, and, and you're right. I, I need to admit there is, look, in this day and age, you're going to be seen, and you, and you need to be. So, you know, I can go on TV to promote my radio show, this and that. And, but Wendy, look what she did. She, she went as a very successful radio person over to being an extremely successful TV rare. person. Pardon me? Very rare. Very rare. Uh, if it happens for me, great. I would love I to have both. My, I would love to have my own TV show. I'll, I'll be honest. I would love it. I, you know, doing this with you right here, I would love to be where you are. And now that they've canned Piers Morgan at CNN, would love to go do that. But you know what? I'm not going to sit here and go, I got to have it or I'm a, I'm a, I'm a failure. Mm. Don't, the base that you have is tremendous. And I see no reason not to do both. Hey, two, two other things. Charity, uh, you inducted Bobby Brown at the New Jersey Hall of Fame. I was lucky enough to be able to, to MC that night. It was wonderful to see you there with Bobby Brown. What was that like for you to be a part of that wonderful night at the Hall of Fame? Well, you know, Bobby Brown, uh, she is just a little powerhouse, isn't she? She's a stick of dynamite, and she has done so well uh, with her, her, not only her makeup company, but with just her message to women, empowering women, to be natural. Yes. She's the only person who makes money from makeup who says, stop wearing makeup. Yes. You know, don't wear it as much. Yeah. And I love her for that, and, and she is an important. A few seconds left. But that was great, oh. and, and, and two, two other charities you're involved in right now. Tell folks. Oh, my gosh. Uh... A lot of them. Well, there's Rock and Raw Hide, where we try Rock to get animals adopted here in the city. And uh, there's Rosie's Theater Kids, where we're getting Rosie's theater kids, kids uh, into the theater. And you Check out Elvis's stuff. He does more charities. And check him out every day from 6 to 10. We're going to do a commercial. This is PBS. We don't play commercials. Listen, we love you. You're great. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey, NJIT, New Jersey Natural Gas, MagnaCare, Sun National Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been made possible in part by activists and the American Medicine Chest Challenge.